I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be joined by the writer of Good Luck to You, Leo Grande, Katie Brand. And I actually wanted to ask you about a lot of the subtext that you were, you've created in the script for this film, because there's so much going on underneath the surface with both of the characters, um, you know, and particularly in terms of, of Leo, if we take him as a character, the amount of astuteness that he has in emotionally reading people and having to navigate, you know, asking questions, making suggestions, reading the response, and, and that being really how he guides Nancy through this experience. I was really fascinated in, in the script writing process, how you approached a lot of that, that subtext in all the things that that tells us about him and all the places that that comes from. Um. Yeah, I, I I think there are sort of three things in the sort of background that maybe that inform informed as my early sense of Leo, um, which is I've always been interested in alter egos. Um, that's something I'm very I love hip hop. I love this kind of sense that you would create a professional self or something that you would pour some sort of other ideas that you might have into and that that becomes a kind of version of you that you take out into the world maybe with a different name like that that's just something I'm generally very interested in and then what that what that might do to the person behind and how the alter ego and the and the, the real person interact with each other and when someone might allow the real person to come through and when they might put it back again and I think that's something I'm interested in but also I think it's something I'm sort of strangely familiar with because I started in comedy, live comedy, stand-up comedy and sketches and so on. And there is an element of that in comedy, especially if you start doing long tours or, you know, long runs in places. You know, of course, things are happening in your personal life that may not make you feel very funny or very happy. But still, there's a gig that night and people are booked to see you and you, you need to go out and be the comedian that they booked to see. So you put that front on and you go out and you do your job and you're professional and you're jolly and you're intimate and you're fun and you know and then you sort of go back to what's <laughs> what's really going on so that was all kind of weirdly familiar to me and also what was all familiar to me from hanging out with comedians or being on tour or even just traveling is that the way you can have fleeting but quite intense connections with people um, and that that can become actually quite an enjoyable way of life for some people for a while that you some people really enjoy that aspect of it that you you might meet someone after a gig or just or a few people and just have a really great time maybe not every time but you might just suddenly have this quite intense but clearly temporary connection and sometimes that leads to the bedroom sometimes it leads to a one night stand but almost sometimes it doesn't you know it's so that all of these things are kind of things that I'm interested in things that I've experienced to some extent and I think, you know, I wanted to put all that into Leo, but also I wanted Leo and Daryl, who plays Leo, has talked about this a bit too, to, to be a young man that is kind of wants to be part of the solution, that wants to listen to people and wants to be interested in people's pleasure. And even though he may have experienced shame in the past himself, he's kind of pushed through to another level of enlightenment in terms of his approach to sex and pleasure and all of those sorts of things. And I was aware of sex workers who particularly operate in countries where it's legal, like Germany or the Netherlands, who, who do have a vocational aspect to what they do. Not everyone does, but they some do. And that also interested me as well, is sort of this idea of wanting to coax other people out of the trap they set themselves in and liberate pleasure in them too, and that that would cause you pleasure, you know, so yeah, it was a kind of, it's a real mix of things. But also I always knew that the actor that played Leo would bring a huge amount to bear and like, you know, that it, they, and what was fantastic about Daryl is that he was immediately, so he seemed very connected to the script, like just the ideas in it. And he seemed to really like Leo and seemed to understand him. So he kind of brought himself into it too uh, and just made it much more 3D and so on. So yeah, we were really lucky to have him. Absolutely. And did you find as you were writing these two characters as well that they both kind of naturally developed a very specific rhythm alongside one another? Because with Nancy, uh, you know, especially at the beginning, there's there's a lot of hesitancy as she's trying to kind of navigate through things in her head before she says things out loud. You know, she's in a room with someone that she doesn't know. So she's thinking and pausing before she says things. And obviously that becomes more relaxed and open as time goes on. And yet for him, you know, he if he's pausing, it's it's in response to her and giving her the space to, to navigate through something, but he has to kind of read her very quickly and respond with things very quickly and, and come up with a way to, to kind of gently open a door to coax the two of them in together. And so how did you find the, the two kind of like rhythms and paces of these characters? Um, well, I think, 
I wanted it to be funny and I wanted them to find each other funny. And, and I wanted them to sometimes acknowledge that this was quite an unusual situation or, you know, that, you know, someone was saying something a bit ridiculous that the other character could respond to that and find and tease a bit and that they could bounce off that and see where that took them. So, yeah, I think, I think you know, the empathy of Leo in being able to coax people out of themselves and know when to be quiet and know when to go in. I mean, I think Nancy says, you know, you just always seem to know when to make the move. And it's just because he listens to people and he really listens. But to me, dialogue is just a joy to write. You know, I will happily discuss and incorporate any people's ideas or, give, you know, if you want to suggest a line, that's fine. I just, if, just let me write the actual dialogue because that's what's important to me just personally, because I do find dialogue very rhythmic and um, I like to use the very specific words and I like to use a lot of repetition and I like to use to find the emphasis on different, the same word several times maybe in a back and forth so it, if if the if the rhythm isn't quite right then then it sort of sounds like a wrong note in a piece of music so I think over the course of a long piece of music you know you, you can have lots of sections that are different you have staccato sections you have more lyrical sections you know and and it's quite nice over 90 minutes to think of it like a, a long piece of music like that that takes you on a kind of journey in that way so yeah, to me, dialogue is, does sound like music. Uh, it does have very particular rhythms. And, you know, I was really glad that Daryl and Emma and Sophie were all like, yeah, we're going we're gonna to have a lock, a lock the script. You know, it's not going to be an improvised piece. We're going to learn this and do it in the right, a rhythm that it's written. Um, and I just was very happy <laughs> to hear that. <laughs> and Sophie's obviously done such a great job in in kind of making it a very visual film as well and really bringing the camera in and moving it around the space but also the foundation of that came from the scripts you know there's certain actions that that dictate certain things you know when Leo walks over to the mirror or okay now we're opening a drink from the minibar so we're going to move over here now you know he's gently massaging her shoulders so they're going to be over towards the bed um what were kind of the most important ways in which you wanted to start creating that that foundation of, of a real fluidity in the space because it never feels stagnant to be in one room with just two people throughout the film because we're always exploring the space and these characters in different and new ways throughout the story yeah I mean I did put in certain stage directions like he does this he massages her shoulders they do this they move to the bed um, from time to time and there was a sense of kind of we're circling all the time but you and the, and the conversation circles and it goes round in circles and they they come closer to a topic and then just move it will sling out again like going around the moon you know the gravity of it flings them out again and then they have to come and orbit it again and get it a little closer and a little closer so there is definitely that going on in the dialogue but I have to say that the movement around the room and the flow around the room and the fluidity and that sense of it not being too static is really down to Sophie and Brian the cinematographer I think and they created a really subtle I think but very clever scheme that you would barely notice but where different areas of the room has have different tones and they may so yeah, there was specific things like he looks at himself in the mirror, she takes the thing, but not so much, not so much direction as you would see on the screen. Like they have really kept this thing moving. It has this gentle current that just keeps this flow going. And uh, again, I was just really glad to see that because that is not my skill set at all. You know, I mean, like I, I, I'm not a director, and I couldn't be a director. It's not how I think. You know, it's, it's all you can do to not write a radio play sometimes. <laughs> you know, it's like. I, I just love to hear them talk. I love the dialogue. Um, and so, yeah, I think the movement that they have put into it with all the use of different, they brought in a steady cam. they brought, you know, all of these brilliant things that they did that you barely notice because they've done it so cleverly. Um, I think a lot of that's really down to them. I have to give them the credit for that. And, and within the scenes as well, you, you know, I wanted to ask about what the challenges were in writing a film where for the most part it's taking place in real time and, and kind of structurally how you determined the in and out point of each of these scenes, where it is within the meeting, you know, is it the beginning? Is it partway through? Is it towards the end of their time together? How many meetings are we going to have? What's the time past? You know, how is that going to influence each of the characters? Because there's a challenge to telling a film that's mostly in real time and yet still having to have these little very nuanced and minute evolutions and changes that happen to each of these characters in different ways within these scenes at the same time yeah I mean initially when I first wrote the very first draft on my own and and for a couple of drafts after I had this I got really stuck on the idea that there needs to be three meetings 
Um, and I had this sort of, you know, you know, just got totally stuck on the three act structure, the rule of threes, comedies in threes, the odd numbers, you know, it, and and it just wasn't working. And it, I, I, in the end, I was having to try and cram too much in. And it, each meeting, you know, if if you sort of had a sense that each meeting was going in real life, might be an hour or possibly two hours later on. And then, so really what we've got is a set of sort of 20, 25 minute meetings that happen in real time. And each time really it's the prelude uh, for the first two, the really it's the lead up to them doing what they do for the rest of the hour. <laughs> you see what I mean? Um, and so you could, that was all right. Cause I could sort of say, yeah, they're going to have 20 minutes of chat and that will be realistic. And then they'll, they'll move on to the physical stuff, but we'll have moved away from them by then. And then we'll come next time and we'll start again. But, but, sort of we've got to ramp it up more so she's going to come in with this list of things that she's got and that'll be funny and we're going to talk about that for a bit and then I had a strong sense that meeting three should be at the end of the, the this bit where they've actually had sex because they're comfortable enough to go straight to that by meeting three and so we can talk and we can find some tension there and I got stuck on that for a bit because there was still more that I wanted to say and the story needed more but I got obsessed with it being three acts and really it was Sophie that just with almost sort of sort of elegant simplicity just said well they could meet a fourth time and it was like oh <laughs> yes <laughs> why it's our film yeah they could meet a fourth time why not not everything has to be in odd numbers <laughs> and so um so that really opened it out just that and suddenly I just went away and wrote a fourth meeting and I put in loads of things that I'd wanted to put in that just I could never find room for and um, so structurally that was really good just to break out of some of those habits you have of like three act structure, you know, all of this sort of stuff doesn't have to be, it may be good advice for some things, but maybe in other things, it doesn't work. And then structurally, I was interested in playing with certain things like, um, you know, in a, this isn't a rom-com, it's not meant to be romantic as such, but you know, where, where, where do you put the first kiss? So usually in a romantic comedy, you're building to the first kiss and that has a real kind of erotic charge to it. And so the, the meeting of lips is something that you're building up to for quite a long time. So I just thought, what if we put the kiss right at the beginning? Like what happens to the script? What happens to the story or the structure if you get that out of the way really early? And then you're actually doing fallout from the kiss. Like So things like that, I think we weren't trying to make a romantic comedy particularly, but it was fun to play around with some of the cliches of that form, you know, because I love romantic comedies, but I've always just been interested, like, you know, yeah, they kiss first, they kiss straight away. If there's no will, they won't they, it's just going to be a will day, it's going to be a constant will day, it's sort of a will they, when will they sort of film, you know, so what does that do to the tension and the structure? So from a writing point of view, from a crafting point of view, it's been a really interesting process, actually. No, I really love that. And and how did that structure also help you in, in creating the structural arc of Nancy's journey and in terms of where her comfort levels lie in particular? You know, when does she feel comfortable enough to start opening up about more details as, as she's talking? When does she feel more comfortable being more physical with him? And so did you find that, that having that initial structure of three meetings really helped in terms of arcing out that trajectory of taking her as someone who was, you know, ready to walk out of the room at the beginning to someone who's really owning themselves in every way by the end in front of the mirror yeah I think I'm a great believer in having an experience then going away and letting it settle and see how you feel about it and so I quite like the idea that I mean I think my general sense that they were meeting once every fortnight or so and possibly a bit quick you know and that some, some time had passed between meeting three and four just to let the dust settle and so you know it may, it, it's kind of it may be once a week it, so it was a sort of periodic meeting but there was time for both of them to go away and let things settle. And Leo would have just been going off and having other appointments and so on. The first two appointments for him were fairly standard encounters, I think. It's only really by the time they get to the third one that things blow up and go off course a bit. So for him, it was like, he just goes and does his other appointments, got lots to do, busy things. You know, Nancy isn't impacting him massively at that point, but for Nancy, Nancy's going away and having seismic shifts and coming back quite different each time. And so, um, I quite enjoyed that sense of her almost as a character having private time away from us and, and how we would see that she changed each time. And so by the final time when we were talking just about how she would look in the final meeting, you know, I wanted her to look much more relaxed that for her whole look to be, that you could almost see in her skin that, that she was exploring her own body now on her own time, that she was changing, doing work on her own 
and that was impacting every time. So, yeah, I'm, I'm just quite interested when, when the main characters dip off for a bit and you try to convey what might have been happening when you next see them instead of having to just see every single bit of their own personal journey. Um, I like novels. I like, I like stories where things jump like that. You know, some things, some novels are so like, you know, every button's described, everything, every door handle, every, you know, every, every car, you know, there's certain rules in filmmaking about like, you've got to see how someone arrives and leaves you know, so the number of times as an actor, I've spent my time having to do a really long driving scene, just driving away from a curb, and then a really long arrival scene. Where, you know, it takes the whole day to just drive away from the curb and then pull up from the curb because the director's obsessed with this idea that you have to see how a character arrives and see how it leaves. You just need, but you don't know. Just ditch it. Just jump cut. It's fine. Just you know, you just got to smooth out the pace a bit. So yeah, being playful with structure and the rules like that uh, is interesting. Yeah, well, I really, really love the characters that you've created in this film and the way that you've told this story. So it's been so wonderful to hear so many of those details that went into it. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you. I'm so thrilled today to be joined by the director of Good Luck to You, Leah Grande, Sophie Hyde. And the first thing I wanted to talk about is the, the visual language in this film, because the way that you've used to, the camera to frame this story really captures a lot of the, the intimacy being explored between these two characters as well, both on the individual trajectories they're on, as well as within their dynamic with each other. And, and particularly when you look at the, the wider shots towards the beginning and the way that you really bring the camera much closer to the characters and introduce handheld as the story progresses. I was so interested in, in how working with the script, you started to envision that language and really think about the way that the camera could bring us into the space and move around with these characters in such an intimate setting. Mm, wow, what a great question. And thank you for noticing all of that stuff about the movie. Um, for sure, like it, to get a story where it's mostly set in one room is a really exciting proposition for a director or for me because I want to focus on the performance and the actors and also the, the small detail of things, you know. And um I found, and then suddenly you're going like, oh, yeah, that's right. We've got to make this pleasurable for an audience and cinematic in this room. And so um, one of the th first things was working with the production designer, Mirren, and the cinematographer, Brian, to kind of come up with the look and the feel of that space and the, you know, how we would move around that space. And I was like, neutral palette, really hard to film. Um, I want a huge window with a sky outside and I would like the light to be able to change across the, you know, the day. And I want the light to be in every shot, basically. So they had to have lights around the room and they had to have light. And so we were doing this film about sex and sex work, but it wasn't going to be dark and it wasn't going to be dingy because cinematically we needed more, do you know, than that. Um, and you're right, like as, as we started to work out, I always think about, coming from the inside of the characters to tell the story. So for me, I'm trying to I'm trying to allow an audience to feel with a character rather than just look at the character, you know, like how do they feel? But with this, we were playing around. Like we were riffing a little bit on romantic comedies and kind of old Hollywood. And so that first act, that first meeting, we were being more playful with that sort of thing. Even the sex scene at the end, we kind of just pan off. Like, um, and it was fun to play with that, to like, these are our leading, this is our leading man, this is our leading woman. You haven't seen them before, but like they are that way. And, and so we were playing more with the kind of conventional sort of shot structure and style and we were definitely wider, you know. Um, through the second meeting, yeah, we started to want to move them and it, Leo kind of shows more of himself or, or kind of puts himself in the room more, I think. And, um, and so we wanted to move around the space more and the camera definitely moves with him and he's starting to physically relax her, you know, and so the camera had to physically relax as well, I think. Um, and, of course, then there are always moments where you want to feel inside the experience of the characters and so, you know, the sound will go away and the the camera will get very close and it's not about one person's point of view at that point. The great thing about this film was the double point of view. So, you know, that scene where he takes his top off and she, she wants to see him. You could easily just watch that and you could experience what Nancy is experiencing. But I really wanted to feel what Nancy feels, the kind of, um, the kind of awe that she's in and the, the sort of appreciation of him, but also feel what Leo's feeling there. Like, oh, like his understanding of what she's going through and becomes important. So that camera has to go between the two of them also in those moments. So I think it's just like 
you know, for me, I just had a fantastic creative team who really rose to all the challenges and the the material that they were doing, you know, it's not flashy. So it's not like here's my amazing camera work or sound design. Like, but those things were so beautifully, delicately done. Um, and then, yeah, like the, the handheld stuff. It was really nice to have a scene that was, you know, could be handheld because of the intimacy. Like we're in a bubble world. It's raining outside. And then suddenly that's the scene that becomes conflict and handheld works really well for that too. So it was just a matter of like being given the space and time with two characters in one room to actually go somewhere with it, you know? Yeah, you know, and, and also with that idea of, of giving the space and time to these characters, you also really did that with the actors, with Emma Thompson, with Daryl McCormack, it, you know, and it, and it sounds like a lot of that took place even before filming and in having two or three weeks of rehearsal. But I love that it wasn't just about rehearsing scenes and discussing scenes, um, you know, that there were also kind of various exercises, like having, every, you know, everybody laying on the ground, just the three of you kind of drawing outlines of your bodies and, and writing certain words or having discussions about what that meant. What was the genesis of, of where you came up and conceptualized the different sorts of exercises like that, that you wanted to do to create this real connectivity, both to their characters and to the material during that rehearsal room so that when you went into the hotel room and you were filming everything was kind of already there in foundation mm -hmm. yeah I just thought a lot about what I wanted to what I've wanted to feel like they got to experience in that rehearsal room and then kind of just make things up now and when I say make things up there's a lot of theatre makers and other people that I've worked with over the years that I've sort of drawn on little bits of their exercises but mostly I sit down and go okay, I, I want them to feel, I want to get to a point where we're talking this way about our bodies or they're able to do these things. And I just think of a few things and literally just make up things to do and um, and change those things as we're going along, depending on what lands and what doesn't. Um, so I've, I wanted them to feel physically like we'd explored their ideas of their bodies as a, and, 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 and therefore the, then the characters' ideas of their bodies as slightly separate ideas and I wanted to have enough time to kind of go over the script, of course, and we did more more of that than I probably would on other films because we needed to block it through, actually, you know, um, to get it done in time. Um, but we just, some of the thematics of the film, you know, there's a, it's a really strong thematic for me of um, understanding and, and appreciating your body as a kind of, as, as itself, as a tool, as a thing that you live in and your home and a thing that does things for you rather than an ornament or something for, to look at. You know, the, the idea of the body as, as a visual, as, as it, it's the way it looks being the most important thing in the world is really problematic for me. And so even in the exercises, I'm trying to create things where we introduced our bodies to each other for the things that they did. You know, like my feet are great because I've run on them. My, you know, this part of me, I, you know, look at my stomach. This is what it's this way because I had a baby and this is the way that it kind of was used. And so how do you meet your body and each other's bodies for what they do rather than what they look like? So it just becomes a kind of constant conversation between sort of getting on the floor and doing things and then talking again. Yeah. No, and, and I love that and, and that idea that that so much of the film is about that expression of, of the body as something that does so many things as opposed to an ornament and was interested in how that influenced the way that you chose to film that final scene with Emma Thompson in front of the mirror because what's so wonderful about it, you know, and she talks very effusively every time she talks about this movie in interviews about, you know, there's no movement, there's no trying to hold anything a certain way and it's there's a real stillness to it. It's someone standing perfectly still in front of a mirror just having that moment of appreciation. And so again, you've also really used used the camera to capture that that element of character as well um mm -hmm. how did you determine that that was the way that that really needed you really needed to film that scene in order to communicate all the things that you were just describing in terms of how you wanted the movie to be executed yeah it was really important that it wasn't just it was a story about two people who meet and they both have a kind of transformation in some ways of course but it also needed to be more than that, that if we're looking at ideas of shame and why we are ashamed of our bodies um, for so many reasons, we it's also great to have a moment with a character where they really do get to look without all of that, all those layers of bullshit. <laughs> um, so we kind of, um, Emma and I talked about that scene a lot and it was a very important moment, And but I knew it would be difficult and you've seen her speak about it, that it is quite difficult for her. But it really was about looking at her body without judgment. She just accessed this, you know, orgasm for the first time. She's, she felt her body do something that isn't like 
a goal being one, you know, it's like, oh, I have access to this feeling all the time. Um, so suddenly she's able to look at her body and realise what it does, all these great things for it. So we really wanted to approach it like that, not in a like, oh, my hot, amazing body. It was like, there's my body. This is what it's for. It's just not for everyone else's eyes or my own eyes to like criticise it. You know, we had images and like pieces of art that we looked at a lot to kind of work out what the image of that was. And in the end, it was just it needed to be simple. It needed to like not be hidden. And it wasn't about like, it was also just showing a woman's body that wasn't, you know, airbrushed and preened and um, and held, as Emma would say, you know. Um, these things became important. I, 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 at one point I was worried though. I was like, oh, but she's, she's very much in the kind of body ideal in many ways. I was worried that people wouldn't relate. But then you realise that although we're used to seeing each other's bodies, our friends, our mums, our kids or whatever, and, and they can be all sorts of sizes and shapes, you know, like we all are, actually on screen we never see bodies that are anything, you know, we see such a limited vision of, of a body. And so it feels like a big, bold moment, you know, when in actual fact it's just a body standing there. <laughs> No, I really, really, really love everything that you did and the way that you've directed and told this story with such intimacy. So thank you so much, Sophie. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Great to talk to you.